you. If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, let's open it together to John chapter 8. I think it's interesting that when we are able to leave home for a few days and you go to a different location, I have found it to be the time where my mind seems to open up and work the best. And that ain't good, by the way. It's just best for me, all right? When I'm on a plane, I just open up and it's just like, okay, maybe I need to be taking some notes here. This just kind of seems to be connected. The fact that we were in the Lone Star State last week, we left on Friday, got back on Monday, had a great time while we were away, uh, began to keep me percolating on what the Lord might have to share with you this morning regarding Independence Day. This is that day, I guess, where historically we do emphasize more our freedom and liberation from the oppression of Great Britain. And like I said, this is that time, and we come around to that. We get a, a federal holiday for this. Uh, the, the National Observance Board will be tomorrow. A number of the places will be closing tomorrow. Some people observe Friday, however it falls. Uh, but when I think about our relationship with Almighty God in heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, it is we as God's kingdom family that can truly and better understand and appreciate what independence truly is. And if there has been a time in your life that you can go back to, and I certainly hope and pray that you can, if you can remember the day, month, and year, that's great. If not, it's okay. But you should be able to recall that time where God in heaven truly and totally liberated you from the penalty and grip of sin. If you can go back to that time, there was your independence day. <laughs> And every day from that point forward, regardless of what day of the week it is or what day number or what month of the year it is, you should be able to start and continue your day in an attitude of in an expression of gratitude and thankfulness. We've had some here in our church family from time to time that will start off with a raised hand as if to say, I just want to thank God for saving me. That can't be overstated. It can be understated totally if we don't continue to live out of a deeper sense of gratitude and appreciation for all that's been done. But this freedom and independence has kind of come at me from a couple of different places. Let, let me just go for a moment back to the state of Texas and let, let's go back, goodness gracious, 150 years. I want to read something to you and ask you this question. Is this something that you might have heard before? I'll bet you haven't. But it's important. This was read, okay, on the 19th of June, 1865. And it's a landmark proclamation. A Union Army general by the name of Gordon Granger in Galveston, Texas, read this. This was landmark. That's what he said. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, I believe that was President Abraham Lincoln, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of the property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freed men are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They're informed that they'll not be allowed to collect the military posts and will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. Why did this have to be read on the 19th of June, 1865? And what does that have to do with freedom and independence? This was read in Galveston. Because two years or more before, President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 issued the Emancipation Proclamation saying that all slaves were free. But for some reason, two years or more after the fact, 
The word hadn't gotten to Texas in the southern part of Texas, either by lack of communication, an unwillingness to transfer the message, the fact that it couldn't have gotten there because it was the southernmost state in our United States at that particular time. It was the last state that was still practicing institutional slavery. And for some reason or other, Texas still was holding people captive in slavery even though two years before they had been freed. So a Union Army general by the name of Gordon Granger rode all the way to an island town on South Texas by the name of Galveston. The location, I believe, was called the Osterman Building, and he read this, and he said, Slaves are now free. Let them go. Let them go. Now, we just established a new federal holiday just recently, two days before I think we actually celebrated it called Juneteenth. And this is the celebration of Juneteenth. And the first year that we celebrated Juneteenth was in the year 1866, the year after this General Order Number 3 was read in Galveston. And now, Rightfully so, and thankfully so, we have issued and made this a federal holiday so that every 19th of June, everyone can celebrate freedom on behalf of a group that was held captive in slavery longer than they should have been. Now, I think about people who were free, and they didn't even know it for a couple of years or more. Think about that. This past week on Wednesday, I went to make a visit for a dear pastor friend of mine whose granddaughter was in a serious car accident. And as I finished the visit in the intensive care area at Johnson City, it was, it was Daryl's granddaughter, Daryl Fletcher's granddaughter. As I'm walking out of the hospital, an interesting picture appeared before me. It was an officer, a law enforcement officer, walking alongside an inmate, bless his heart, in an orange jumpsuit and shackles. Now, if you've ever walked from the public elevators to the intensive care unit at Johnson City, that is a walk, okay? That's like walking from here probably to Hobnob. It's a walk. And I had quite a while to walk a gilded distance from behind him, maybe from here to the back wall, and I just began to ask myself the question, What's their story? Now, we're moving from people who were free, but they didn't know it for a couple of years or more, to a man walking alongside a law enforcement officer in shackles every step that he already took, he knew it, because the chain rattled between the ankles. Here's a man who's enslaved. He's bound. And everybody knew it. But then you get these people here in John chapter 8. They were slaves and didn't even know it. If we put those three groups of people out here and I were to ask you which condition is worse, what might you say? Father, today we're thankful for freedom. We are thankful that we can stand not in and of ourselves, but in you, with you, you and us, and make a declaration that we've been set free. I pray today, Father, if there are scales over our eyes that have somehow formed as if we think we're free, but we're not sure, or maybe we know we're still in bondage to sin. Or maybe we're here, Father, and we need to be more actively involved in sharing truth with hope that brings freedom. Whatever our case individually is, Father, speak to us this day, we pray. We love you and we thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. John 8.
John 8. That's too long of an introduction. This is that passage of scripture that falls in line with some of my favorites because this begins with a story that's very near and dear to me. As Jesus is speaking with a group of people who are very contentious and antagonistic toward him, he's addressing a group here and a group of religious leaders bring a lady who's caught in adultery. We know this story. We know that Jesus is confronted. We know that there are words here at the beginning of John 8 that tell us what their intention is they use words here in the scriptures about test and accuse, things of that nature. So really the problem that the religious leaders have is not with the lady caught in adultery, it's with Jesus himself. It is that instance in scripture where Jesus stoops down twice to write something in the dirt and those people who came to accuse her started leaving uh, from the oldest to the youngest. That's an interesting detail in scripture always have wondered what was it that Jesus was writing in the ground that caused them to feel like they had to leave. But as they continue to work through John chapter 8 there, we get up to verse 13. Jesus is defending his self-witness. He stands on the highest, most credible and authentic foundation of authority because he's not only God the Son, he is God. And what he's trying to tell them is, listen, the things that I am telling you are true because I am truth. I bear witness to myself. The Jews come back and say, you know what the law says about saying things like that. You have to have at least a testimony of two. Jesus says, I've got that. I've said it, and my Father in heaven bears witness to it as well. So there's your testimony of two. They're not going to be satisfied with any type of resolution and conversation that would bring them around to where Jesus is. But then he goes on after that and begins to talk about his departure. They are so lost <laughs> intellectually and spiritually that when he starts predicting that he's going to be leaving at some point in time, they actually step back and say, hold it. Is he talking about maybe taking his own life here? What's he mean by this? I mean, this can just continue to go on and on. Jesus basically comes around to this and says to them, you, you really can't understand what I'm saying. The reason is you can't understand is because you don't know me and you don't know my father. And if you don't know me, you can't know him. And if you don't know him, you can't appreciate who I am and what I am here to do. Oh, this just continued to stir the pot here. But in verse 30, and that's what we're going to pick up today in Scripture, here's what begins to happen and spin out of this. We can't call this conversation, this is actually more debate, okay? In verse 30 says, as he, Jesus, spoke these words, it had an effect. Many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. He's talking about what we would refer to in this day and age as a genuine salvation experience. If you truly believe who I am, you, you follow the example and the teachings that I provide. And if you do that willfully because that's what you're led to do, hey, listen, you're part of me. You're part of me. Now, we're not quite sure at the what level or depth their acceptance and belief was. We've got to believe some of them certainly were genuine here. But listen to what he says in verse 32. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you what? Say it again. Shall make you what? Free. Free. Now, get this. This just shows you how far out in the left field they were. They answered him, verse 33. We're Abraham's descendants. And we've never been in bondage to anyone. Really? <laughs> really? Jewish religious leaders look around at the very moment that they make this ludicrous statement. They're in bondage to Rome. Any time that you go back in the nation, history of the nation of Israel, God would bring them back to the realization that you were once in bondage and I set you free. 
Remember Egypt? Remember in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians came through and took the ten northern kingdoms into captivity? And remember what happened in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came through and took the southern kingdom captive? And after the Babylonians, it was the Medes and the Persians. My goodness, Jews, religious leaders of whom you think you know, you think you're all that in a bag of chips, my goodness gracious, look around and consider your history. You've always been in slavery. And to make a statement like this, as if being a descendant of Abraham is the solution to your spiritual problem. Come on. But how close are we in this day and age, generally speaking, to the same way of thinking? Folks will place their faith and trust in what they believe has saved them in any number of things, even faithful family members. The conversations I've had with people over the years at the church when they come through maybe to maybe through the benevolence ministry, and when we get to talking about where they stand with the Lord, the place that they'll go several times. My dad's a preacher. I mean, that's where they'll go. Or, oh, here's another one. I, I grew up in church. Let, let the enemy get hold of that. He'll blind you. Or any collection of good things that I've done over the years for different people, as if they're going to be standing before Almighty God with this crowd of supporters around them to plead their case on their behalf. Listen, there's nothing in Scripture to support that at all. When that time comes for those who don't know God through faith in Jesus Christ, when they face their condemnation because they lived a faithless life while they were here, when they stand before God, it will be He and them. And the Bible says for those who are lost, books will be opened, lowercase b. And those books will contain the evidences of a life lived throughout their life, not out of faith in Jesus Christ. It is the Lamb's Book, capital B, of which we hope and desire our name will be recorded in, and it will if we come to saving knowledge in Christ. It's been recorded there for all eternity. Your name has been written in heavenly places as if you are already there in his presence. In fact, spiritually, he being in us and we in them, he, we are there. We're just longing to leave here in order that we can be where we all long to be because our redeemed hearts have been transformed and in a spiritual sense, transferred. Church, just as Jesus said in verse 32, if you know the truth, and you truly have acted on the truth in saving knowledge, you can be free. Jesus said this, how can you say you will be made free? This is in, in response to their, hey, look, we're, we're Abraham's descendants. Hey, Jesus, don't, don't you know who we are? Don't we know, don't you know? Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Ooh. Now he's getting to the heart of some things here. Listen, for those who sin, they're, they're, they're just obeying the nature of sin that they were born into. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. If we die in our sin, heaven will not be our home. Spiritual death, eternal separation from God. But then he goes on to verse 35 and he says this. Now get this. This is important. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But a son abides forever. And then I love this. Jesus goes ahead and just sets the nail. He said, therefore, if the son, capital S, makes you free, you shall be how free? Free. Indeed. Truly, really, free. Now,
Now, historically, let's take a walk back to the first century at the time that these letters, these Gospels were written. In the Roman Empire at this time, and I can't give you an exact amount of just how many people populated the Roman Empire, but I'm going to tell you, it went into the millions, millions, millions. And I have seen it, I believe, referred to like this, that the number of slaves that made up the total population of the Roman Empire could have approached about one-third. Think about that. Slaves could have come from other areas. And what those slaves, listen, this is not man slavery that it later developed into that God's word has never nor will ever support. This is not man slavery as we know it. This is indentured slavery that people would voluntarily place themselves in in order that they could work off a debt that they weren't financially able to pay monetarily. They'd work it off. And sometimes this would be an extended period of time. Some of the people who made themselves slaves actually acquired quite a skill, were quite well thought of, could actually practice law or be a doctor. And some of the relationships between masters and slave was actually pretty cordial and affirming. Some were not. But the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about slaves working in the house here, and Jesus says this for us in verse 35, a slave doesn't abide in the house forever, but a son does. One commentator said that as Jesus is laying this out like this, he's got Isaac and Ishmael in his mind. And you remember the story, I believe it's in Genesis 21, as to how those two boys came into this world. Isaac was the child of promise through Abram and Sarai in their older, later years. Listen, Ishmael came through a handmaid. Isaac was the child of promise. Jesus could have been thinking about this as he's making these statements. But I want to ask you the question, church, as we're here on Independence Day. Where would you, who would you rather be in the house? A son or daughter or a slave? And what would have been the difference? If you were a slave working for a slave master, you probably would have come in at a certain time. You would have left at a certain time. You would have come and gone. You worked out of compulsion because that's what you had willfully pledged yourself to do, bond service. But with that position in the house, you had no guarantee of any inheritance at all. And if it were long-term indentured servitude, the only immediate hope that you might have is that by the time we arrive to the seventh year, the Jubilee year, where slaves would be free and debts canceled, that was what you could look forward to. But who's to say with the uncertainty of life and finance that you might not find yourself in servitude once again? That's the slave. He had no personal rights of his own. He only did what he was told. And he could only come and go as the master told him to do. It was done under compulsion. This was a performance-based relationship at best. The slave in the house. But things change with the son or the daughter. Because if you're the son, you've got the guarantee of an inheritance when it's time to leave for the father is no longer there. What is it that we are told in this life? And I believe Paul wrote, in fact, he did in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17. Even that when the challenges of this life start to press in on us, Paul wrote it like this. He said, regardless of what we face, in comparison to what we will experience when this life is over, Paul said, it will appear to be like a light and momentary affliction as compared to what and who we'll have when we arrive in heaven one day. But you see, the slave, the slave, 
He's merely residing in someone else's house. Now, we as Christians, let's take this and let's turn it just a bit. Because Christians, those who know Christ personally in this world, do you understand that this world in which we inhabit right now is fallen? Okay? It's a fallen world. And there is someone else who exerts a great deal of influence in this world in which we inhabit. These people, now, now get this, I want to invite you now back to the scriptures. Because as this conversation, debate as you want, we might call it, begins to move out of free indeed then Jesus gets very direct with these people who continue to levy these accusations and these criticisms. And he talks about the reason why these religious leaders say and do the things they do. And it also refers to the house in which we are inhabiting here and the fact that we're only pilgrims here on a pilgrimage passing through until we arrive truly where we all long to be and that Christ made a way to. Listen to Jesus here in chapter 8 verse 42. Let, let me just back up to verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Now don't miss the capitalization there or lack of it. Father lowercase f. Okay? And now listen to what they say. They said to him, Jesus, we were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Now, the term fornication here, sexual activity, inappropriate sexual activity, and it's outside the bonds of marriage. Okay? This, this might be a dig at Jesus, a personal dig at him. They could very well have been recalling how things had spun and been told about how Jesus came into this world. Oh yeah, Jesus, you're saying all these things to us, but don't you think we don't remember what people have said about you? The fact that your mother got pregnant before she got married? Listen, don't, don't you be leveling accusation against us. They, I mean, and they'd say that, you know, we weren't born of fornication. And it's not explicitly stated here, but they could have been going at him personally with that type of remark. Now get this, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me, capital H. Why do you not understand my speech? And he goes ahead and answers his own question. Because you are not able to listen to my word. Get this in verse 44. You've heard this before. You are of your father, lowercase f, the whom? The whom? The devil. Ooh. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He's a liar and the father of it. What a statement. You know why you're not getting me, Jewish religious leaders? Well, let's just get to the point. You're just acting like your daddy. The devil. You can't understand what I've got to offer you. You don't know me. You don't know him. Jesus would even go as far as to say this. You know, you say you're a descendant of Abraham. Why aren't you acting like it? Abraham would never do this. He would never do this. So church, once again, while we are here, and for those people whom the enemy has succeeded in blinding them to the reality that without Christ they are lost and undone in their sin, and without Christ, if their life were to end in that state, heaven will not be their home. The enemy is very skillful in lying and deceiving in order to convince them of, listen, of at least a couple of things. Number one, for people who are so preoccupied with this world and the things of it, 
Our common adversary can say this. You know what? Everything you're looking for in life that will fulfill you can be found in the world. It is our common adversary taking the things of this world and itching our sin nature. And if the enemy catches us in a place without Christ there to safeguard us through the presence of the Holy Spirit, he can convince people everything you're looking for is here in, in the realm of which I am exerting a great deal of influence. The world is your answer. And what he's not telling them is, you're going to have to continue to accumulate more and more and more, and you're going to find out, unfortunately, that the half-life of satisfaction and fulfillment is very short. Therefore, we're going to try to grab and grasp more as we can. The enemy is a liar. It's his nature. Somebody said that if he's got a revolver in a holster, it's, there's only one bullet in his gun, and it's the bullet of deception. Holy Spirit enables us to know when our Father speaks and when our enemy tries to distract and tempt. The enemy might also try to convince people here that, you know what? You're okay. You're, don't sweat it. Hey, you're, at your core, you're, you're good. You're all right. You're right. That flies in the face of of the truth as well. It's one of those places, if I get an opportunity to witness to someone about the good news of the gospel, if they're trying to build a case for their own goodness apart from Christ, I have to be very careful when I come back and say, what if I told you that the Bible is very clear and explicit in revealing to us that there are no good people apart from Christ? Would that shock you does that surprise you? Some people will look at me and say, I didn't know that. Some people actually have gone as far as to almost say this. I was afraid of that. That takes salvation out of their hands and it places it within the grasp and the reach of mercy and grace of our Father in Heaven who's infinitely larger and more capable. It is His work that saves. And when you take it away from mankind and they realize, I'm not going to be able to earn this. That is a truth that God's Holy Spirit wants to use to lead them toward freedom. So when we talk about free in verse 32, Jesus says, listen, you can know the truth. The truth will set you free. That type of truth will enable you to understand that faith in Christ and a life lived out of that faith can enable you to understand I have been freed from the grip of sin and I can avoid sin's penalty. I have heaven to long for and everything in between salvation and heaven I'm going to offer God as a love offering. As a love offering to Him. To show him in some way, shape, or form just how thankful and grateful I am for all that he did to make the way. You see, it's not only being saved from the penalty and grip of sin and being saved to heaven. Jesus went on there in verse 36 to talk about being free indeed. And we've mentioned this a number of times here. The opportunity, God living in and out of you, to experience life with some sort of meaning and purpose. Because you're not living for yourself any longer. Paul talked about this, I believe, in Galatians 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's a joy and a challenge, but sometimes an indescribable fulfillment when we're not living for ourselves any longer. We're living for Him and offering to others in His name. That, if you've experienced it, you know is free indeed. Free indeed. To be all you can be for Christ. One more thing before we close. This thing about Abraham and their relationship to him. Let's go to verse 51 real quickly. And we'll draw things to a close from there. 
Jesus says this about Abraham. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham's dead, and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Can you just sense the nature and tone of this conversation? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. If it's my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God, yet you have not known him, but I know him, and if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Goodness gracious. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Get what Jesus says here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. The Jews said to him, You're not 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In my Bible, I am there in verse 58 is all caps. What's that mean? Once again, Jesus is asserting himself to the truth that I am God. If there was anything that offended the Jewish religious establishment more than any other, it was those claims that Jesus made about himself. And Jesus said, I'm not doing it on my own behalf. My Father in heaven stands to testify about me as well. Question, Abraham. Abraham, Jesus said this, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What did Abraham see, and how did he see it? And what's the connection to Jesus? When I think about being free indeed, I think about this great benefit of being God's child, where when he inserts and implants himself inside of us, Spirit of Truth, Holy Spirit, it's how the Holy Spirit enables us to see. Jesus said in John 5, I'm at work. My Father's always at work. We've always been working. Always. He's eternal. But with Holy Spirit living inside of us, not only can we look forward with hope, we also have the ability, church, to look back with a sense of clarity. This past week, my youngest son called me on Wednesday with a tone in his voice like I had not picked up on in probably well over a year or two. It looks like he's found a job. And he actually did some clinicals within a group that it looks like he's going to be working with. He hadn't had hope like this in a long time. And he got to laying out some things for me. Some of the people that he actually became reacquainted with were people that he got to know a few years ago in other places. One of them, if I'm not mistaken, he actually practiced piercing her ears, which in the state of North Carolina, for a child, it has to be done in the doctor's office. So there was an ear piercing day. And Evan apparently didn't have enough children to practice on, so he practiced on an adult. Little did we know back then that that lady would pop back up months and months later in a position that just might be of help to Evan as he continues to further his way along. Evan's statement to me was something like this. I can look back now, Dad, and I can see where God is putting some things together. Now, Abraham did die, and Abraham is in heaven. But when Abraham was alive, God allowed some things to happen. If you remember his encounter with a priest by the name of Melchizedek, king and priest, and you remember after Abraham had achieved victory in a war, that Abraham met him, and that king priest gave Abraham what? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Could it be that when Abraham was in heaven, taking in all the glory and grandeur of heaven, 
that when Jesus Christ there in the upper room was serving the Last Supper, as we call it, to his closest followers, and Jesus begins to extend the bread and the cup around the table that maybe in heaven Abraham saw that and said, I see that, but I can look back and sense that I saw it once before. Maybe the child of promise that Abram and Sarah had at such a late time in life. And as Abram and Isaac are walking up on Mount Moriah, and he's got that knife ready to take the child of promise's life. He didn't understand it then. But when Christ went to the cross and gave his life, maybe Abraham from heaven could look down and say, my goodness gracious, I didn't really quite understand it all then, but I see Christ on the cross and I can understand it better now. My son Isaac was as good as dead. I was going to take his life. God said he did it in a, in a faith walk of such that he reckoned God could raise him from the dead. That had never been recorded in Scripture before. What faith? And when he walked away with Isaac back off the mountain, having found that ram in a thicket, a resurrection of sorts, Isaac, who was reckoned to be dead, now alive, maybe when Abram in heaven looked down and saw Christ come forth from that tomb. Maybe back then, when he's walking off the mountain, he didn't quite understand exactly why things happened up there the way they did. But when Abraham saw what happened with Christ, he said, I can understand that because I've seen that before with my own son. God in and through his children enables us to connect the dots. It might be at times that God might even allow you to look back in your life at things that happened and give you a bit of a sense of the direction in which he may be taking you. He may not give you the two, three, or five-year five -year plan, but the fact of the matter is he can affirm you along the way to ensure you you're on the narrow path, you're within bounds, stay the course, and stay faithful. That's who he is, and that's one of the great benefits of being free in Christ, in fact, church, free indeed. Do you know him today, church? Do you want to know him better? And today are you here, and you might be stirred and moved with the question of how can I impart this freedom truth to folks who may be looking in strange places to find the key to their freedom? What might it be? Miss Brenda, if you could come up and we'll dismiss with this. As she's making her way up, let's pray together. <laughs> Father, we are truly thankful. We are thankful for you. We are thankful that we're so loved. We are thankful most of all for Jesus. And today, Father, if we truly know you and we've been set free, truly free, I just pray, Father, that we'll enter into each day asking you, Father, how can you help us be more faithful with the time we've been given? Each and every one of us have been given the same amount of time in each and every day. Help us to be, help us to be found faithful in your sight. Help us to be personable. Help us to be willing. Help us to model free indeed. If we know you, Father, there's no way we can keep you in sight. Please have your way in our life, we pray. In Jesus' name.